Greetings, religionists. This week is our first unit. We're going to look at tribal religion. And these are the first religions of humankind. And no matter who we are, whether we're in Asia, Africa, Europe, um, North America, our ancestors practiced tribal religion. And so we want to look at what is that and part of our analysis for this week is bringing into play substantive versus functional approaches to understanding religion. So functional religions, we, we look at how religions function in the economy, uh, sociologically how do they function, psychologically for individuals and masses of human beings. These are some of many functional approaches to studying religion. Then substantive approaches look at what the religion means to the believer. It's also called a phenomenological approach. This doesn't mean we're looking uh, for the right or wrong religion or judging whether religion is right or wrong. Uh, we're simply studying religion as it appears in the minds of human beings. And we want to credit Mircea Eliade and, uh, of course, importantly, his teacher Carl Jung for understanding that the consciousness itself is reality. And if we think about it, there's no religion that could possibly exist uh, apart from the minds of human beings. So again, I like to say, if you don't like religion, you're really saying you don't like human beings, which, you know, many have that view. So Eliade's breakthrough work, The Sacred and the Profane, uh, examines these two views, and I'm going to simplify his thinking quite a bit here, but note that everyone has an idea of the sacred in their minds. Now, the sacred is juxtaposed against the profane, profanement before the temple, so picnics and the like are profane activities. It's not just about cursing the Lord and the like. And then the sacred, however, uh, is there in the minds of everyone atheist, agnostic, you name it. And I like to cite my favorite example of the Green Bay Packers uh, as uh, uh, really the true religion of my state of Wisconsin. Uh, you can see people go crazy and spend crazy money just to go to those rituals, uh, which of course they are reenactments of tribal warfare. Just so we know. So not only the Packers, but maybe for some it's a cabin in the woods. For others, it is an image of the Buddha, or an icon of Christ and his mother. Uh, one person's sacred is another person's profane, but I think most all of us will agree that brushing our teeth in the morning, and maybe in my case, driving to work, sadly, uh, that these are profane activities. They're not special. So, a big part of Eliade's discovery from visiting countless tribes and seeing the same sort of social structure and for that matter, uh, mental consciousness about the sacred in all these many tribes he visited and many people from many religions. Uh, he discovered that there is the figure in the tribe called the shaman. The shaman is not the chief. And uh, the shaman is not simply a witch doctor uh, doing magic. The shaman is the one who makes the otherworldly journey sometimes via hallucinogenic substances, other times through dance and drumming. The point is we get to an ecstatic awareness in the mind of the shaman that carries the whole tribe along. The shaman is, again, not the chief. The chief makes the political decisions, but the shaman really runs the show. And for those who may have seen The Lion King and the like, uh, it's very easy to figure out who the shaman is in that very popular movie. It is, of course, Rafiki, who engages in a typical shamanic healing activity, uh, a soul retrieval, where he pulls Simba out of his dejection and despair and restores his identity as his father's son. And from there, the healing commences. I don't think any of us can deny that kind of healing by a shaman, even if most of us go to medical doctors and the like who've usurped the role of healing of the old shamans. We do see the evolutes of shamans today in the figures of rabbis, priests, Buddhist monks, and the like, uh, but nothing do we have in the modern 
industrialized world, quite like the old tribal shaman. Now, another thing very true about all religions is that uh, they share these features in common. Many don't realize that religions evolve. Some, like the uh, very well-known, scientific, kind of materialist, atheist Richard Dawkins, seems to think that religion is something that happened back in the Bronze Age, in the time of the Hebrew Bible, when uh, little infants were smashed against the side of walls and things like that, and that anyone who would believe such a book or such events must be mad. Well, the truth is, he does not apply science to religion, and that's what people in my field do. We apply scientific principles to understand this universal phenomenon. There's no place on the planet untouched by religion. And so, let's take a look at the phases of religious evolution. This uh, Tree of Life chart here shows, for example, uh, the age of fishes. There was a time on this planet where there were only fish, nothing more complex than that. And likewise, in the world of religion, there was a time when there were only tribal religions. And so, the tribal religions involved the shaman, and the shaman was part of the family, not a distant clergy person like the Pope or the Dalai Lama. The shaman and those religions were unique to each tribe, not homogeneous uh, religions like we think of religion today, with creeds that everyone recites in precisely the same way across vast stretches of our planet. Out of the tribal religions we see the emergence of agriculture in the ancient city-states anywhere beginning possibly as early as 12,000 BCE, give or take, uh, but most definitely with the emergence of the culture of Sumer around 5000 BCE and then we see ancient city-states emerge and they will spread to the Yellow River in China to the Indus Valley in India and of course Egypt. Those are the four seats of ancient civilizations and the religions of those civilizations tend to resemble human cities. If we think for example of the Greek case with Zeus as the mayor, Ares as the Department of War Minister, Athena, Department of Education, Hephaestus of Industry, we see that religions always mirror human consciousness. Out of this phase, which I will analogize with this age of amphibians here, we see the emergence of the Axial Age religions. These are the ones that most people think of as religion. Karl Jaspers, brilliant German theoretician of religion and many things, realized that Confucius, the Buddha, and Socrates all emerge in the middle of the first millennium before the Common Era. We also see universalizing themes emerge in pan-ethnic cultures. The prophet Isaiah makes it very clear there is only one God of the universe, for example. That had not been the case in earlier stages of the evolution of the Bible. Likewise, Socrates will be given the death sentence in part for corrupting the youth to believe the Greek gods were cartoony fakes. And in fact, he says, well, the universe is comprised of a divine consciousness, and our consciousness is an instant of a universal principle. The universal principle emerges in the Upanishads of Hinduism, and of course, with the Buddha's own no-self doctrine and co-originating interrelationship, everyone on the planet could ascribe to those views. Likewise with Confucius, his social system can apply to everyone in a pan-ethnic situation and becomes the dominant paradigm for East Asian religions. And of course, Taoism will emerge with an idea of the Tao as an all-encompassing presence comprised of the interwoven energies of male and female, yin and yang. Out of the Axial Age cultures, though, then what will come next? This is the question, because religions evolve. My opinion, in fact, my certain view, is that science itself is the new global religion for the planet. We can analogize science then, as we did the Axial Age religions to the age of 
reptiles, science here will be the age of mammals in our tree of life. There is no place on the planet where science is not practiced that I know of. Maybe some obscure tribes here and there still certainly exist, though they're dying out rapidly. And science tends to be practiced roughly the same way from East Asia to Europe to the North and South America, Africa, everywhere. So science is then the new religion for the planet. And for those who think that religion is escapable, it is not. Whether you believe in God or not, you're part of God's, or at least religion's, sphere. So the question really isn't, am I religious or not? The question is, how am I religious? Now, I'd like to look at different theories of religion. What is religion exactly? So many think it just involves belief in a supreme being, some old man in the sky like Zeus, or as some uh, think of Jehovah as being this old man in the sky. But not all religions are structured that way, so let's take a look quickly at a number of theories of religion. Now first, um, we can start with a very basic, I think very useful one, and that is George Lindbeck's definition of religion as a primary worldview that dictates thoughts and actions. And so, borrowing from philosopher Wittgenstein's idea of religion is language games. So if you don't talk about Jesus and his stories, you're not part of the Christian game, he will say. So a worldview seems like a great way to go for understanding religion, but there are other ways of understanding it. We may look at Mircea Eliade here, who discussed the sacred and the profane. We call his approach a phenomenological understanding of religion. And in this sense, we can say, that religion is a phenomenon we can observe and we can see from culture to culture the diverse expressions of very similar things. And we call this phenomenological approach substantive because it is indeed the substance of all religions that they inhabit the sacred aspect of our consciousness. And this is true for individuals. We can make generalizations across masses of humans However, it really occurs in the minds of individuals what they value, what they will kill for, and what they believe and do based on their sense of the sacred. Such as a reverence for sacred mountains, we can think Mount Kailasa, Mount Tai in China, or uh, Mount Zion in Jerusalem. General patterns uh, characterize all religions. So Eliade understood the sacred as something distinct and set apart from the rest of the world, from our humdrum day-to-day -day existence. And so for some then, uh, the Green Bay Packers could be a religion. And I would say here in my home in Wisconsin, uh, it's fair to say there are more Packerites than Lutherans or Catholics. Now, another way we can understand religion is from the standpoint of economics. Religions impact the economy and we can see uh, two diverse opposing views and both correct. Karl Marx will tell us that religion is a means whereby the rich and powerful can funnel money from the peasants on up to the Pope or the Dalai Lama and the like. And certainly we see that as a definite distinctive feature of religions on the planet. However, we can also see places where religion shakes up whole economies. We can think, uh, maybe most famously, of Max Weber's thesis uh, that Puritanism and its striving for demonstrating individual virtue over the old medieval Catholic grace, if you will, that came through the church, that through hard work one could demonstrate one's electedness to heaven by being rich. So that is why we celebrate here in America uh, the Thanksgiving Day. I call it Thanks Stealing Day because the Pilgrim Fathers are indeed the fathers of the nation. Now, uh, we can also look at religion from the standpoint of psychology and yet again get two diverse yet true views of religion. For many, 
Sigmund Freud here is correct. Religion serves as a vehicle for infantile delusions. So for example, let's imagine I had a, le a weak or lame father and so I choose an ideal father in heaven to make up to compensate for my lack of basic trust in a human father. The father I can imagine uh, is of course everything I desire. The only thing more sad than that might be the paraphrase the old atheist bumper sticker where theists are s imaginary friends like God are stupid is that not even having imaginary friends is possibly more stupid. Because how many of us feel a need to buttress uh, our feelings of insecurity or our sorrow and depression with going beyond this world to a transcendent sacred realm at least in our own consciousness if not for real. Now in psychology, though, we can't deny that Eric Erickson is also correct. The great shakers of human civilization, I, he studied in particular Martin Luther and Mahatma Gandhi, two people taking their spirituality and applying it to reshape whole cultures through their attainment of ego integrity to the point that social whims did not cast them about uh, in a sea of confusion. We can also see that religion and sociology go hand in hand as well. Emil Durkheim spoke of religion as a, a glue for whole societies. We can think how the Confucian Taoist Buddhist synthesis helped shape East Asian culture, or for that matter, of course, Christianity and European history and sociology go hand in hand. Uh, we have Christian democratic parties throughout Europe, and the flags of European nations have crosses on them, and we can see Buddhist circles in Asian flags as well. So he, along with Peter Berger, who spoke of religion as a social construction, that makes for a sacred canopy again over vast millions of humans. If we look at maps of religion on the planet, we'll see Muslims are all grouped here and Christians here and over here are the Hindus and the Buddhists and birds of the feather, they flock together. Now, from the perspective of anthropology, we can see that morality is no hard and firm thing either. Ruth Benedict discovered from studying cannibals in Southeast Asia that cannibalism is uh, not only acceptable and tolerable, it's a downright good thing. A strange kind of barbecue, we might say. However, all our human ancestors practiced cannibalism. And so she realized from studying a variety of different tribes uh, that, in fact, uh, they all shared this similar practice that we in modern society find distasteful, abominable, and punishable even by death. Now, we can't ignore the role of gender studies in religion. I like to say uh, even though women were closed out in the 7,000 plus years of patriarchy and civilization where brute strength for throwing spears and the like uh, was the reason for power in a society uh, that we can unpack these things. And Mary Daly has noted that the religious agenda is often simply crooked men's agendas. And so these days we can unpack millennia of patriarchy and try and understand what religion may once have been with women shamans and the like. Of course, it was Carl Jaspers, the philosopher, who realized that the phases from the religions of ancient city-states shift to what he calls the Axial Age with the appearance of Confucius, Socrates, and the Buddha in history. These are human beings who develop systems that apply really to everyone beyond tribal distinctions. So a pan-ethnic kind of ideology emerges in the Axial Age. And then uh, Watsuji 
noted that also religions evolve in concert with climate. And so when we think about things like uh, yoga, for example, in India, it is a product of monsoon culture, the culture whereby in the summer we can't go outside because of the storms and the like, and so we stay inside and put our body through all these strange contortions. We can contrast that with the German habit of winterizing or hibernation where uh, the polka dance is more likely to warm your blood. And this is something that Eliade discovered the shaman was a universal feature in all the tribes he studied. There's always in a society that religious person uh, who heals the society, tells where the hunt may be, uh, and of course performs funerals and initiation rituals. So every human is religious. It's built into our DNA, even our brains, and to the point that he defined the human being as homo religiosus, or religious us. That's what the homo means in this. The same. We are humans and we can run from religion, but we can't hide. Not only an awareness of the sacred and the profane as we discussed, but also every religion has a sacred spot, a place, a temple, maybe a shrine, maybe just a totem pole, but a sacred place. And every religion has sacred objects. These may be the shaman's drum, for example, or they may be an icon in the Vatican itself. And then every religion has sacred time. We're going to find out from India on east that people see the world in terms of a cyclical time. Countless trillions of universe cycles. In fact, the current universe according to Hindu time measurements, has existed long before modern science's Big Bang. In fact, whereas the linear view, meaning we have a beginning and an end to time in the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, that in fact the world is very short-lived so far, measuring time as they do, back around the founding of Sumer uh, in modern-day Iraq. We'll also find that there are three main types of religious figures. The first of these is maybe the most easily understood, at least for those in uh, the West, and that is the figure of the prophet. We can think, though, uh, in fact, to tribal lore and see an example of a prophet. When we think of Gikuyu going to the mountain top, Mount Kenya, and there hearing the voice of Ngai, their God and bringing back a message for the people. Well, that story sounds rather familiar, I bet. Indeed, Moses is a spokesperson for God. He is not God. Muhammad, as well, is a prophet. Uh, but he's not a sacramental figure. There we have to look for man gods. Now, the Greeks and Hindus have tons of those. But in the Abrahamic religions, there's really only one uh, noted by, of course, the Christians, Jesus Christ as sacramental means he is both divine and human, but he is not the only uh, sacramental figure, of course. We have Dionysus, Heracles, and Krishna, and Rama, and we could go on and on about divine God-men, although we can add that Dionysus uh, and Krishna were both died and resurrected it, as was Heracles. Is that not odd for these sacramental religious figures? And then uh, we look finally at the mystical figures. There we have to really look from India on east to China, and we will see uh, people like the Buddha, the Tirthankara of the Jain tradition, and uh, Taoist, even Confucian, Figures all look within for divine wisdom. Now we'll find for Taoism and Confucianism, there really is little to even no separation between the sacred and the profane. So there's much in store as we look through this class. And in fact, uh, breaking down these general features in our first unit is critical. And then as you're writing your essays, uh, please do cite our readings. That's how I separate the proficient from the solid, from the 
satisfactory. That's a rough way in which I grade these things. And so do please see all my rubrics and uh, explanations in the text. And as you're doing your quizzes, uh, again, your job is to go out on the internet and hopefully read beyond the question at hand and learn more so that by your second attempt, uh, you're likely to get 100% if you do your job. Well, good luck, and again, always uh, feel free to email me, or again, Google Video Chat is excellent. Facebook, I've sent around links. Uh, please feel free to contact me anytime, because I'm not a fanatic about one religion, but I am a fanatic about religion.